everyone. Come on in, grab a seat. We're going to get started here. It's a great morning to have a coffee, so I was giving everyone a little bit extra time to enjoy your nice warm coffee here at One Million Cups. How's everyone doing today? Good, good. I knew that, I told Matt, I said, Matt, you're going to be a big draw. People are going to come out to ask you anything they want to ask you. And so uh, we actually had a cancellation in our original speaker lineup, and I said, what if we tried this? And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So we were doing our first ever AMA with an entrepreneur, and we, uh, it's the person who usually, gets to, who usually tries to ask all the questions. So now it's our turn to ask him the questions. So show of hands if you are a first timer at One Million Cups. First time you've ever been, oh wow, more than I thought. Okay, uh, we're gonna do this, um, Craig. So we're gonna do this quickly, but just give us uh, your name, where you're from. Uh, we'd like to introduce our newbies, so tell us who you are. Well, good morning everybody. My name is Josh Hader, candidate for state treasurer. I'm from Huron and it's a pleasure to be here. And this is my wife, Amanda, from Huron as well. Say hi to Amanda. Well, she can introduce herself. <laughs> there you go, honey, get up and do it, sorry. Amanda Hader here on South Dakota. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Christy Golden, Hartford, South Dakota, and I work with um, CyberClimb, which we do digital marketing. Okay. Oh, She's been here before. She's a regular. <laughs> I think the gentleman in the blue coat, or no, sorry. Oh, yeah, Valerie. You've never been? Yeah, it's kind of embarrassing. Um, Valerie Wilson, I am with the Sioux Falls Area Chamber of Commerce. I usually watch this online. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's a little embarrassing. This is my first one, but wanted to come see Matt. So, all right. Valerie is one of our uh, co-organizers co of the Hey Sioux Falls event, so she's very helpful. Uh, yes, Mark sir. Mark Shields, uh, been here in Sioux Falls about three months, work at KDLT. Uh, Will comes in, does a Wired Wednesday, and invited me down. And so uh, I'm a musician. and pretty impressed with Sioux Falls, so good to be in the room with you all. Great. Three months. Well, welcome to town. This is definitely one of our goals of One Million Cups, is just to, to meet new people. So, yes, sir. Hey, Mark Opp, Edward Jones, uh, first time coming to this, of course, and uh, a financial advisor here in town. Welcome, Mark. Did we get everybody? Gentleman over there in the back. Mike Stevenson. Whoa. Mike Stevenson. I'm with uh, Marisar Real Estate. Thanks, Mike. All right, so for those new people since, did we get over? Okay, cool. What are you signing up for? What did you just come to? One Million Cups is a weekly event. We do it here at the Orpheum or sometimes on the other side of the Orpheum and then one time a month out at Zeal, the Center for Entrepreneurship. But this is an event that goes on in about 150 plus cities across America, started by the Kauffman Foundation out of Kansas City. So to help and grow entrepreneurship and foster community, we're here every Wednesday and usually you hear from a speaker they get six minutes to tell you their story, their origin story, what they started, the company, the project, the nonprofit, you know, where they got the idea and, and, and where it's going and growing. And then you guys get 20 minutes to ask that speaker questions. And so this time today, we're going to change that up a little bit. I'm going to ask questions with Matt until I get sick of asking questions. And then I'm going to let you guys ask him questions. And we're just going to do an AMA with Matt, one of our, um, I'll say, most notorious uh, One Million Cups attendees. So. One thing we do here at Sioux Falls every week is a quick calendar of events. So let's see, it's late October. If you have an event in the next, we'll say, three-ish weeks that are coming up, you may make your way over to the microphone and tell us about it. Um, there's so many things. You can do that now. Um, there's so many things going on in our great city of Sioux Falls, and we want you to know about them. So if there's something you want to share, this can be community-related, entrepreneurship, business, networking, um, art, culture. We're open to hearing about it. So. Craig will give you the mic and tell us the, the who, where, when, what, why. Good morning. I'm Greg Boris, and you all work hard, so you need to have fun. And tomorrow uh, is the first of about eight nights of Kaylee dancing at this old courthouse museum, Irish Kaylee dancing. You don't need a partner. You don't need to know anything. Just come and have fun, live music, and uh, starts at 630 to 830 Thursday, usually the fourth Thursday of the month. And there are posters in various places in Sioux Falls. So live Irish Kaylee dancing will teach you what to do. Cool. And you'll have live music. There you go. That's something uh, something new for sure. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I am Gabby with Core Cares in Home Services. And we're having a community education event on communicating with those who have dementia. 
It'll be on November 1st from 12 to noon at our office, which is by Fuddruckers. It's 3101 West 41st Street. And you can find more information on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash core cares, and that's with a K, K O R E, and then cares. Thank you for com, sharing. Facebook slash core cares. You bet. Valerie. Hi, guys. As stated before, I'm with the Sioux Falls Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we actually have our morning mingle coming around the corner. Um, October 31st. We are going to be at the Boys and Girls Club um, and we're going to, it's it's just basically a networking, socializing coffee. Coffee is provided by Caribou and uh, we're encouraging Halloween costumes because it is the 31st and we're going to have a prize for the Halloween costumes. Um, the location of this Boys and Girls Club is the one that's on Sneeve. It's about three blocks from uh, Sturdivant's Auto Parts on East 10th, yeah, East 10th Street. Um, I'm going to break the rules again. Um, <laughs> we also have our holiday fair coming around the corner too. That is going to be November 20th. Uh, it is a expo. We have 42 booths there. We do have booth space available for anybody that is a chamber member that is interested in having a booth at our holiday fair. Uh, the cost is $175. So contact me if you guys are interested in having a booth. Cool. Thanks, Valerie. All right, there you have it things to do in Sioux Falls. So let's get right to the show. Uh, with that, let's see. Oh, we got a mic. Perfect. Uh, let's welcome to the stage uh, one of our co-organizers co of One Million Cups and the founder of MarketBeat.com, Matt Paulson. Hello. So give us the, for, fo for folks who don't know, what do you do? Uh, so Matt Paulson, I run a financial media company called MarketBeat. It is a service for our people that invest in, in uh, single stocks. Um, so typically the scenario is um, our audience is uh, primarily a male, 50, 60, 70, 80 year old, so kind of an older audience, uh, affluent, and they own 20 to 30 companies, and if they want to know what's going on with their stocks, you know, the wait, choice. Wait, wait, they own, t like stocks, yeah. or they own 20 companies, or like 20? stocks. Okay, okay. Yeah. So to like keep track of them all, you'd have to go to Yahoo Finance, or go not Google Finance anymore, like one at a time just to like see what's going on. We aggregate all of the news and relevant financial information, um, then personalize it based off the stocks you own, and we send out a kind of a daily news update, um, you know, for the companies that you're invested in. My understanding is you wrote the code for this like in college, right? Uh, it started, yeah. The code it was base like a blog at first. Yeah, the, yeah. The code base originally, in yeah. So we started a personal finance blog. It was called American Consumer News. I'd write four articles a day. Um, then I'd share them to like dig.com and all the other social sites of that day and just try to scrape traffic and or scrape as much or not you know, scrape up as much traffic as I could get. And you know, I kind of grew that to maybe it was like it was probably a hundred grand a year business by the three or four years into it. Um, but it kind of kind of capped out there. Um, and that's kind of when the when the pivot kind of started to investing. Okay. So I probably will ask you less questions about Market B. I mean, you guys can ask whatever you want. That's the idea. I like to know more the origin of, of, of people as entrepreneurs. So did you think that you would be an entrepreneur when you were, say, a young buck? Um, so I was the kid that went through the park next to my house and picked up aluminum cans and recycled them for cash. Um, I had a website about SimCity in eighth grade. And I, I made like 25 bucks a month from it. And that paid for a lot of Mellow Yellow back in the day. It was before I switched to Diet Mountain Dew. Um, DMD. So. Um, okay, and what what drove that? Like, were you motivated by like the game? Did you want to make money so you could then buy things that you wanted as a kid, or like, did did your parents instill that in you? No, it, I think it was mostly out of necessity. Like, we were not a super wealthy family. I mean, there was always food on the table and a roof over my head, but um, like, I didn't really get a lot, like, get get any significant allowance. I think I got like maybe a dollar a week and then five dollars a week in high school. Um, so if I wanted money, it was pretty much I had to find a way to like work. And I, I, at the time, I used the best options, what I thought were the best options available to me. So a lot of people, I feel like, who grow up learning how to code and, and have some sort of origin story with technology or with machine mm -hmm. computers. You took them apart, or you, you got your first computer in, at a certain age. What was your um, introduction into? Or did you not do coding until you went to DSU? No. Um, so the kind of unfair advantage that I had was that my parents um, had bought like a home computer for us. Um, geez, maybe fourth or fifth grade or sixth grade. I can't even remember now, but it was like a 
Pentium 133, 16 megs of RAM. And in, I think, 98 or something like that, we, had, we were like one of the first families in the city to get cable internet. So when everyone else was limited to like 10 or 20 hours a month, you know, we had a couple megabits. The phone bill. Yeah, yeah, and just unlimited internet time. And then with my SimCity website, I was able to save like 800 bucks, and I bought my own computer in like eighth grade, and then it just went, you know, went from there. Still have the SimCity website? Uh, I no, I, I I've been trying to find a copy of it on archive.org, and I just I can't find it. I bet you still have the domain though. Uh, no, there were th no. This was like the before. This was like when domains it's were hundred dollars like a year. Geo pages. Yeah, it was geocities.com slash yeah. Times Square slash Alley slash seven four six eight. Look it up. Look it up. Bookmark it. And now favorites. Um, okay, cool. So you go to DSU. You know they. You know, I think fo may, most folks probably know this, but they put out some really talented young students who many of them get placed in really great jobs um, in the government and, and Microsoft. And did you think, yeah, I'm going to go get this great job, or did you say, I'm go getting out of here and doing my own thing? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, early on in college, I, I thought that would be the case. I thought, well, you know, I'm going to graduate college, I'm going to get a job, and I could make 40 to 50 grand a year. That's going to be a lot of money. Um, you know, as, as a college student that you know made ten bucks an hour, it's like that sounded pretty good. Um, and I, I did get that I did get that job out of college. Um, I did web dev work for a company out of here for four or five years. Um, but oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And you know, it was it was pretty. And it was we had an office for the first kind of year or two, and then w it was all remote. Um, so everything kind of just kind of blended in. And um, when we had our baby, Micah. Um, that's kind of when I said, well, I don't have enough time to be a dad, have a job, and run my business. So um, I, 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 that's kind of when I, I made the jump to run Market Beat full time. Sure. That was probably six years ago now. Okay. So it started as a side hustle and then became its own thing. Yep. Um, I always like to ask this question, and it's a two part question. What is your, what is your greatest day as an entrepreneur look like? Mm -hmm. And then conversely, the worst. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think the greatest, my greatest day involves work. Um, it's not a day off. Um, I like to build things. I like to create things, turn turn nothing into something. So a great day is for, for us to you know launch something new that people find value in. Um, the worst day is, um, I don't know. I think the worst day I is either. Um, so we, so like our. Our previous web host was down for like 48 hours, which is just like death in the internet business world. And there's literally nothing I could do about it. Uh, that was probably the worst day. So like the site crashed, you mean? No, like so they had to move the server to a different rack, and there was some weird power stuff. And it oh, the site was just down for yeah, 48 like hours. Got it. So I ended up restoring from a backup to a new web host for like 24 hours into this. And it was just a terrible, terrible day. <laughs> so then similar to that question, um, as you I think as entrepreneurs, we learn so many things as we go, right? We, we, everything we learn is probably because of, of make, making mistakes. Um, so what, looking back at, you know, Market Beat is still going, but looking, we'll say like 10, 30,000 feet at Market Beat, what do you love about your business? Like, what do you like, man, I, I really did that right, whether it was accidental or intentional, and what do you wish you could change about Market Beat? Yeah, um, so Market Beat, it, it's a business that relies heavily on automation. It's a mid seven figure business that works with just works um, there's four employees that work in a company, work at the company. Two of us are full time, two of us are part time. So, in terms of um, leveraging um, technology, did you guys hear that? Two part time, two full time, mid seven figures. Um, so, That's like impressive. Leveraging labor and automation and s and systems and processes is is like the best thing about MarketBeat. Um, I I, I, s I often do wish you know I I could work with an audience that's maybe a little bit more tech savvy. Um, so we could do some more, more innovative and new things, um, you know, to get uh, like none of our, none of our, like we can never advertise on Facebook because our audience of primarily older men are just not on Facebook in large numbers. So I was like, that's that's not available to me. Um, so I don't know. It would be nice to work with a younger audience, um, but so, you know, I never we never really set out to target our, the demographic we have. They found us and. Know that's kind of where we're at, and where we're going to be at as long as they own this business. Sure, sure. I'll take two more, and then we'll open it up. Um, I think I remember meeting you. I think it was 2013. Will Bushy actually introduced us Thanks, um, because we were putting on the very first startup weekend here in Sioux Falls, 
And I remember Will was like, I need you to meet this guy. I think he might be interested in, in sponsoring. So we, we met at, I think, Spazia. We yep. had lunch. Um, and we ran this event and ended up running, out the, running the event for like three or four grand that year. It was for our total cost. And so I remember sitting down with Matt and I was like, uh, I was like, well, I think, you know, we need, do you think you could do like 1500 or 2000 and And he's like, yep, I'm in. And then I was like, shit, I should have asked for more. <laughs> because I think he ended up being like, I would have just said yes to whatever you said. But I think that, because th that was really, I remember, th I tell the story because it's funny, but also that was a moment where I, you know, I met you and then it felt like all of a sudden you either, I don't know if it's strategic or just uh, a mind shift, but you, to me you were, not that I know all the entrepreneurs, but I felt like I knew a lot of the entrepreneurs and I hadn't seen you kind sure. of in the game, right? I hadn't seen you at places um, out and about, and that made a, a big monumental shift. And now you're, you know, very involved and very passionate. You write posts about what our entrepreneurial community needs. You, you, you help us with events like this. What, what was the change? Yeah. So I'd been working at home by myself for probably uh, maybe two years by that point, kind of maybe a year, year and a half on um, at my day job, and then a year self-employed. And I kind of realized, you know, I'm, I'm an island here, and I probably, I probably won't grow um, if, if this is what I, my, my plan. And I wanted to be engaged in the community, to build relationships, to you know have um, have opportunities, and um, you know also like you know the, like there's the idea of kind of a third place. You know you have your home family, your work family, and then maybe a place after that. Like I had my home family. You know, love my wife Green, great person, but I didn't I didn't really have the work family, and I didn't even really have the third place either. So just like I I was kind of looking for where, where are my people at and. I, I think I think I found them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna open it up. I haven't given you any hard questions yet, but last one: um, Who made that amazing logo you guys have? Uh, this local design company called Lemon Link. Oh, nice. <laughs> Not sure I'd hire them again. Kind of hard to work with. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get in there. Okay, raise your hand. Let's questions AMA for Matt. We'll get to as many as we can as long as you guys want to stay. Uh, well, up until ten, because that's always my promise. Got to really walk the long way. Yeah, just raise them up, guys. We'll just go. We'll just go by proximity. Cool. Matt's an efficient answer. Hey, so Matt, we'll get congratulations through. on what you've done. And I guess two questions, not really related, but I mean, where do you see the ceiling for your business? And obviously, there's competitors that offer a similar service that you offer. Uh, how are you going to continue to innovate that? Mm -hmm. And then shift gears here a little bit. 99% uh, of the people in this room will never code anything in their life, uh, but you've proven that you can take your skills and magnify that into a bigger business. Those of us that will never code, do you have any advice to how we would uh, work around that problem and still be able to figure out something to magnify to build? Okay. So the first question is, you know, where do you think you're going to cap out at? Um, so we were at two and a half million two years ago, and I honestly thought I was capped then. Um, we've doubled the size of the business since then. So I, I, I don't know if it's it's how my brain's wired, but I always think I, I've peaked, and there's nothing else that I can figure out how to how to work. But you know, we keep hitting new milestones every year. Um, what do you attribute that to? Like uh, I keep learning stuff and trying different yeah, things. Yeah, new p exposure to new people, new ideas. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's, um, it, it, you know, our competitive advantage uh, to answer that question. Um, what a lot of our competitors do, um, they use kind of third-party, off-the-shelf tech, um, and that kind of limits how how creative they can get. Um, so for us, um, if if somebody like clicks on a sales link to a landing page, like I can just log them in automatically. Um, and other people, they would have like a step in between. Um, so I, I can reduce kind of that friction between the, the customers and what they want them to do with my technology that other people can't. Um, so if I can kind of simplify that funnel, you know, it would be higher conversion rates, better sales. Um, I'm also better at acquiring um, email signups than about anybody. Uh, we are between the, the leads that we buy and then the, the organic signups we get, we're at, we're at over 50,000 email signups a month. And nobody else in our industry just knows how to do that as well as I do. Uh, your second question was, how do you leverage automation? Um, I want to take inventory quick. I hope this room is a little bit better than that. Like, raise your hand if you've written code before. All right, there we go. I know, typical rooms, typical rooms. Yeah. Just wanted to rep the people <laughs> who are writing code. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, so I, I think the key with like how I've been able to scale market is just have really good processes, and that they don't have to be written in code. Um, like for, there's a lot of tasks that are in our business that you can't really automate, 
So we write a standard operating procedure for each of those. And then we set kind of a recurring task for somebody to do that. Um, so it's almost like writing code for people. Um, and that works pretty well for us. And that way if somebody leaves, which honestly, like, you know, my first employee, Stevie, has been working for me for five years and is still around. Rebecca's still around. Like, n nobody's quit on me, so I haven't had that problem yet. Um, but I, li I like the idea of having repeatable processes that you can handle about anybody. So I'm willing to spend more time on that documentation up front, and then yep. hopefully it'll save me some time down the line. Yeah, that, that's one thing I definitely admire about Matt, his automation. And, and I think all of us, if, you, if there's something you do in your business, at least on a weekly basis, you need to write a playbook, like a, a, a process, so that it can be either automa automated or even delegated down, right? Like, what's the what's the value of your hour and the value of your time? And if it's something that, if someone can do it for less, and I know you think this way, then, you know, delegate that down and spend time on the high-value task. All right, who are we going to next? Yes, sir. Go up to the 30,000-foot level again. We've got an election coming up in a couple weeks, and um, what do you see local, state, or federal government doing right or wrong that helps entre that affects entrepreneurs? And what would you like to see local, state, or federal government doing to help entrepreneurs? Um, yeah, so I'm pretty happy with our state in terms of, mostly in terms of what they're not doing. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's really easy to start a company here. Um, there's not a lot of red tape, um, and they mostly leave you alone. Um, the Department of Revenue has never bothered me in any serious way. Um, so in terms of that stuff, that's really good. Um, Federal stuff, I think, is kind of a mess for everybody, and I don't know how to fix that. Um, what one thing I would like to see is, which is kind of hard to do because we don't have a state income tax, but North Dakota has a uh, tax credit for angel investing, and so but I think it's, I don't, I don't know what the rules are, but if you put money into, uh, invest money into startup companies, you can get some kind of tax deduction or credit for that, and I think that, that uh, has helped them spur more risk, kind of risk capital or venture capital investing in that state than what we have. So I. I I, I don't know if it's politically feasible, but I'd love to see something like that where it's um, incentivized to take risks on companies. Matt, do you ever think you'll be involved in politics? Uh, maybe. Okay. Um, it'd certainly be at the local level if I was, and I don't think it'd probably be for five to ten years. You heard it here first. Hey, Matt. Uh, hey, Clint. I just have to say I... I before my question, I so appreciate you because I think you're probably one of, if not the most generous 30-somethings I've ever met with your time and finances. And I, and I know you're very, very private about that. Um, but uh, for those of us who've seen it happen or recipients, it, you're, you're a life changer. So I appreciate that. Um, one of the questions I have for you, and I think because people know I know you, so they ask me, is I think you're a misunderstood character partially because you put yourself in the spotlight um, and partially because you're a strong personality and speak your mind. Um, what do you think is one of the most misunderstood things about Matt Paulson? Question. Um, I, I think there may be, there probably is, I know there are some people like in our space that think I'm, I'm a, a bit of a jerk or I'm intimidating and some of that's probably deserved. Um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> but. <laughs> If I tell you I think something's like a terrible idea, it's because I love you and I don't want you to make a mistake. Yeah. Um, so I do come across as, as, as cold and hard sometimes, but I'm doing that out of love. And just well, and I think especially in a, in, a, in a part of the country where we maybe aren't very good at being as direct and honest, yeah. you provide that, which I think is valuable. Yeah. For sure. Maureen. You haven't come across as a jerk to me yet, but <laughs> there is wait. probably some value in being it's a jerk coming. once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I've got two questions. Um, so one, in this day and age, we are all saturated with input. One type of those input is email. And in some ways, email's starting to feel like it's going out of style. People are like, text me, or people are like using Slack, or all these different apps. I could see a person not wanting another email cluttering their inbox, and that's like what you do uh, in, in a good way. But anyway, um, do you see something else coming, a new format like an app, or, or do you have any fear around email going out of style? Second unrelated question is curious if you would just talk about like the sources of revenue into MarketBeat, advertising, subscriptions, things like that. Sure. Uh, so I think what 
I, I feel like every every three to six months there's an email saying or uh, an article saying email is dead. We're all moving to Slack or we're all moving to Facebook Messenger. Uh, the reality is that there are three billion people in the world that use email, and compare that with like one billion that use Facebook. So if you think of email as a social network, it's three times the size of Facebook, and the usage is actually growing. Um, I mean, there's a reason that Facebook and Twitter and every other social network want your email when they sign up. They don't want your Facebook account. So I, I'm not too worried about that. The way I always test that, raise your hand if you check your email before you get out of bed. Yep, yeah. there we go. Uh, your other question is, you know, revenue sources for MarketBeat. Uh, you can kind of think of us as like a newspaper. Um, so we have kind of paid subscriptions and we also have advertising. Um, the, the kind of breakdown between those two do shift back and forth. Uh, but right now we're probably about 70% advertising, 30% subscriptions. And it's not that I designed that business that way, it's just that the demand for advertising against an audience like ours it's just continu like has been at an all-time high and continues to grow and has been that way for the last several years. Is this banner ads and just media buys? Or uh, some banner ads, um, some placements in our newsletters, uh, a lot of it's from email, um, stuff like that. Kay. Do you ha is that how you want? Is that the ratio you want, or do would you like that to be um, 50 50 or? I, I'd honestly flip it if I could. Yeah, um, but sure. I mean that's just the business reality of, of where I'm at. Yeah, makes sense. Andy. Hey Matt. Hey Andy. So on the con on the topic that Clint talked about generosity, um, everybody knows your business for the most part. You're very transparent about your finances. I bet the least known fact about you is that you're a graduate of Sioux Falls Seminary. It's true which is completely in left field for most business people. How does that and your faith, you're a very strong believer, how does that play into any of this? Sure. Um, so I got, so I had a computer science degree out of, out of college and I moved to Sioux Falls and I thought, you know, I, I, I don't feel like I'm an effective, I, I don't feel like that was enough for me to be an effective leader. So I kind of looked at like, maybe like an MBA and I also looked at the seminary program uh, you know, I'm certainly, I'm a Christian, I'm certainly very active in my church, and I just wanted to be a better leader in all aspects of my life, and I kind of looked at the curriculum and like, you know, what could I learn from this versus what could I learn from an MBA program, and I picked the seminary option because I, I just felt like it would make me a more well-rounded um, um, kind of leader in kind of all areas of my life. Um, so I got to learn about like church history, I got to learn about like people management, church leadership, and in um, just a lot of different areas, and I think that's been a very beneficial thing to me. Um, no, I mean, no, I'm no, never going to get the pastor job, uh, but the reality is that most people that go to seminary these days uh, aren't going to be pastors. Um, there are people that are in their careers that, uh, whether it's business, nonprofit, church, that want to become better leaders, and I was happy to be one of the, the early examples of that. Yeah, and we've heard from the Sioux Falls Seminary, they have a very innovative program that's not just about pumping out pastors, yeah. right? It's building leaders and yep. yeah. And uh, I learned today that Sioux Falls Seminary is now the fastest growing seminary in the country. Wow. And they've done some really innovative stuff. So go talk to Nate if you want to hear more about that. But it's um, there's they're doing a lot of good stuff. Very cool. All right, Dwayne. So Matt, you uh, crank out a uh, market beast press pass. And you and with your uh, inimitable persistence you land a one on one interview with Elon Musk. You get three questions. What are they? Well, I, I want to challenge the, the basis of your question because we don't do journalism. MarketBeat is not a journalism organization. We're, we're an information aggregation service. So like, I, I would not call myself a journalist. I, I wouldn't do an interview. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting things we can learn from an Elon Musk. Um, well, you're becoming a politician already. Um, oh. <laughs> what? Yeah, what would you do? Okay, one million cups. We bring Elon Musk yeah. to Sioux Falls. What, you usually get the first question. Yeah. What do you ask him? Um, I, I, I feel like, I mean, he's got the, the Trump problem of, like, not being able to keep his hands off Twitter. Totally. And I, I would just ask him, like, it's like, what, do, what are you hoping to, hoping to achieve by, you know, being active on Twitter and, engaging haters and people that are calling you out and I just like does something beneficial come from that what motivates you with that why why I mean don't you have other things to do <laughs> yeah run two companies mr. Gackle yeah so you said market beat predominantly males who are older 
recognizing that's your audience, do you have any plans to spin off or to create a different model that would cater to the younger subset and maybe female subset? Like I'm thinking about those who in the um, financial planning world have changed from being uh, selling products to like $100 per year to meet with people to give just advice in finding their business exploding. Like have you thought of spinning off in any way to try to cater to a new market? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly the, the new market that is everybody in our space is trying to hit now is crypto, has been for the last couple of years, and that's a very different demographic. So right now we have a crypto section on Market Beat for our people can look up coins and see information about them. And um, I, I, I kind of wonder if we should move that to a separate um, kind of domain, a separate brand, because there is not a whole lot of overlap. So we have the trademark for, for Crypto Beat. Um, so we could could do that if we wanted to. Um, we could do that logo for you. <laughs> yeah, yes, you could. Uh, Always uh, hustling. I, I mean, the reality is like we're a service for information about stocks, and the people that invest in stocks um, primarily are um, older people, and they're primarily men, and that's the inf just the reality of the situation. Younger people tend when they invest, they tend to do mutual funds, um, kind of either work with an advisor or they do like a betterment to a wealth front and that's just not our target audience and you, c you can't be everything to everybody and I just don't see a need to try to do that. Well I suppose your market is still huge, like you still have a lot to go oh, capture. Oh sure, no right. there's, yeah I mean there's there's people with There's a lot of old, old men out there. Yes. <laughs> uh, Linda. So similar uh, question to that, so you've been doing market beat for 10-15 years now, mm -hmm. so you're probably kind of in the maturity phase, you're young. What's next for you? Do you have any new innovations, new products, new business lines that you're thinking about? Um, good question. Yeah, Market Beat, like the current model, has been around for seven years now. Um, it is getting to the point where it's a mature business. Every year we do an, a survey of like our customers and say, you know, what are we missing? What should we add? What should we change? And um, we've kind of hit all the low hanging fruit. Um, so yeah, um, I, I never really know what's next because um, if I knew what was next, I would have already done it. Um, so I never have a good answer to that question. Um, I'm the type that when I see an opportunity, um, I, I'm either yes, I'm all in, let's do this, um, or I'll get it done right away, or it's like that's not for me. Um, What's your criteria to identify that? Um, I mean, a lot of it is, um, you know, that I, I get a lot of people that you know ask for coffee, want to be business partners. You know, there's a lot of inbound type of stuff these days. Uh, so the first kind of filter that I use is, you know, who is this coming from? If John says, hey, we should do this thing called Hey Sioux Falls, it's like, oh, I know John, I like, I trust him, he's, he and I think alike, uh, you, know, that's probably, you know, that's probably an easy yes. If it's somebody that um, is just off the street, has never engaged in our community before, you know, that's going to be pretty hard for me to say, yes, I'm interested. Like I had a guy yesterday send me a Facebook message and saying, hey, do you have time for a business meeting this week? And I was like, I don't really know because I have no idea wh who you are, what your business is. And he's like, that's the beauty of it. And I was like, well, <laughs> what? <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm not going to respond to that message. Um, so, you know, it, you know, is it somebody I, I know I can trust already? Um, is it, um, and then does it kind of align with the things that, I'm, that I care about and I'm interested in? So is it, um, is it an entrepreneurship thing? Is it a uh, uh, Christian leadership evangelism thing? Is it... Uh, a money investing thing, and, and those are kind of the you things. You have some buckets, essentially. Yeah, definitely some buckets. Yeah, cool. That makes sense. John Smalls being our um, Craig had to leave, so thanks, John. Thanks, Mr. John. Mr. Martinson. Hello, Matt. You nervous? Nope. No, good deal. So Matt lived with me for about, what, 10 years ago you lived with me? Yeah, 2007. Wait, I yeah. didn't know this. Explain yeah. this story. Fun, fun fact, right? I had a and summer I internship, and I needed a place He worked really live. hard. Like, he, he was always working. We had to go down to his room and feed him and make sure he'd come out and... <laughs> <laughs> You know, have human interaction and take him for a walk. Yeah, take him for a walk. But you know, he, he didn't get here just by, by totally by luck. You know, it was it was hard work, and I confess to that. But two questions. Uh, number one, I'm a Fargo boy, so I go Bison. But uh, what does Fargo have that? What does Fargo have that Sioux Falls needs? Mm -hmm. And then also, why do you shovel your driveway but you don't mow your lawn? Good question. <laughs> yeah, that one is a lot harder than the other, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Fargo. This uh, is breaking news. Yeah, uh, they've got a lot of good stuff going on. I think we have a lot of good stuff going on. I think 
they're better in some ways and we are better in some ways. Like we have the angel fund figure thing figured out, they don't. Um, they've got the ecosystem organization figured out, we don't. Um, I, I would like to see, you know, we, a lot of the stuff we do is fragmented um, and their stuff is, is kind of centered around a, a single nonprofit that kind of runs everything and they've got a paid staff person that, that does that like, you People, know, a million, yeah, they have, yeah, they have like seven or eight, yeah. yeah, they have a team that like does this stuff. But like a million cups is John, myself, Andy, a couple other, Abby, a couple other people, vol Craig, uh, volunteer that just, this is, this is our thing. CEO's got its stuff going on. The chamber's got its stuff going on. Um, you know, there, there's our Facebook group that's, um, people are like organizing events that I, I, I don't even know about until they're organized. So it's just, it's, it's very fragmented here and I wish it was less fragmented and I'm not 100% sure how to accomplish that right now, whether that's to Zio or a separate organization, but I, I do feel like we've got some room to go there. Um, mow my lawn. Um, so there's a guy named Ben Lee and he had a kid named Isaiah. Um, and Isaiah was starting a lawn mowing business and uh, Isaiah um, mowed lawns but he didn't shovel snow and I just never bothered to think about outsourcing that. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, Isaiah went off to college, but he thankfully had a little sister, so she's mowing my lawn now. But I, I doubt she wants to come over at like six before school and shovel my snow, so. Um, but I bet you could find it, someone it, who would. Yeah, if somebody wants to shovel my, my, my snow, I've got money, so just come tell me, <laughs> come tell me that you want to do that. Amen. Uh, what do you tribute, what, uh, here. Here. what do you tribute the success of your um, reaching out, getting your emails, at least at 50,000 a month, and then your conversion rate. What drives the traffic to your site, and why are you successful at converting it? Uh, yeah, so we get as many email addresses as we do for a couple reasons. Um, we kind of pioneered the idea of automated financial content. So say Wells Fargo releases their uh, quarterly earnings. Um, we can take that kind of structured financial information and turn that into an article and post it to one of our websites um, without a human ever being involved. Um, so people will read those articles, they'll see the pop-up for MarketBeat, they'll sign up. And the other thing, you know, nowadays, like that's not even like the majority of it anymore. Like that's how we got started. But now we spend 70 to 100 grand a month on acquisition. Um, so we just spend a lot of money on, on email signups for, for advertising. And I know that I can spend two to three dollars for an email signup. And then I know over two years, I'll make seven to eight dollars back on that email. So, you know, I'll do that all day, all day long. Is, uh, is the aggregation part is there a machine learning or like natural language processing element to that? Will that continue to like the content get more relevant to me? No, okay. it's uh, it's kind of like Mad Libs. Okay. Um, it's a little bit smarter than that, but not much. So it's, you know, this but company announced their earnings today. They announced this dollar per share. Um, and it's, you know, goes on like that, but it's, it's a little bit more sophisticated li than that, but it's. Would know, that be a way you could, you could go, right? Like I could, you could tailor it more toward me based on um, the machines learning that or no? Um, Maybe, uh, I'm, I'm not. I'm not like a, a deep data science guy. Sure. I'm. A, I'm more of like a web programmer guy. So like, if if I if I wanted to do that, I'd probably have to like hire one of those people. Um, uh, I, I would need knowledge I don't have right now. Sure. Okay. Uh, Brandon, I'll ask you a web programming question then. Uh, can you kind of walk us through the history of what your tech stack has been? Like what you originally <laughs> built it in server type of configuration, yep. how you've grown since then and any sort of like vendors and why you outgrew them, et cetera? Sure, um, so this might disappoint you. Uh, .NET Web Forms, and it's still .NET Web Forms. <laughs> um, certainly we've, we've, we've kept up. Um, we haven't mo moved to like .NET Core or anything like that yet. Um, and uh, the unfortunate reality is there's no business case to make that transition. Um, so we're kind of stuck with .NET Web Forms for the foreseeable future until it gets end of life, which hopefully won't be for a while. Uh, you know, Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, we haven't haven't moved to to any kind of cloud. Um, we haven't moved to Azure or anything like that yet. So it's, it's pretty basic. Um, you know, for for providers, we use we use like Twilio for SMS. Just like everybody that does SMS uses Twilio. Uh, we use SendGrid for email deliverability. Um, we were using Amazon SES for email um, initially, um, but their support was not good. And um, their Indian support person accused of, be, of being like spammers for penny stocks because they didn't understand the difference between like Microsoft and a penny stock. And I was like, well, this is not gonna work. I need to be paying somebody more money than I'm paying. And I found SendGrid and they've been fantastic to work with. And we pay them six or seven grand a month for email deliver 
delivery because we send like 30 to 40 million emotes a month now. Um, but it's worth every penny that we pay. So, uh, I mean, in an organization of your age, is there some technical debt that you feel like you have to take tackle someday? Uh, Rebecca's shaking her head yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I think there is. Um, you know, there's code that I wrote in 2010 that's still being used. Um, and actually, let, let me pause. Like, one of my goals with One Million Cups, too, is that we can always teach and educate. So, like, so not that some people might know, but explain what technical debt is. It's a problem that a lot of companies have. Yeah. So, it's so technical debt is like when you have programming code or some kind of software um, that was written a long time ago that still works, but it's very difficult to maintain. And it would take you a lot of time and money to, like, update that and fix it so it's more maintainable. But it's just a big, hairy problem, and you sometimes it's easier just to not fix it. Um, I don't know if you have a better way to describe no, it. No, I think that. that's perfect. I yeah. mean, I think uh, uh, another company might have inventory or a liability or something that you know mm -hmm. um, is, is physical. But for a tech company, a technical debt can be one of the biggest challenges. Yeah, I don't think we have any huge problems there. But like, if we were starting from scratch, we would not be using .NET Web Forms. Sure, because the performance isn't there. Yep, different era. Um, Rick, we'll go a couple more if you guys want to keep going. Matt, I understand that you do four articles a day. Is that used to? Okay, and the question is, is what kind of information do you gather? And and I've got an interesting insight that perhaps you are up late nights and early mornings or whatever. So what is your time schedule that you do that and sure. compile these articles? Routine. Yeah, um, it's changed over time. Um, yeah, I mean, I used to be a late night person. I've never been a morning person. Now I have kids, uh, and that's changed my schedule. So. I get up 6.45, 6.50 every morning, get the kid ready, take him to school. And now I, ch I try to keep a more 8 to 5 schedule. Um, like, I kind of reserve the 5 to 9 p.m. time for family stuff. So I, I typically don't go to many events in the evening and probably never will. Um, so, I mean, if I'm going to work for 8, 9 hours a day, um, you know, that, that other time, I, I save for my kids. Um, so, I mean, I work pretty normal hours now. I do work Saturday mornings often. Sometimes I work for a couple hours Sunday afternoons. Um, I don't think I work many more hours than anybody else these days. I used to, though. Um, that's slowed down now. So do we have room for two more or one more? Uh, uh, yeah, we, we can do two more. Well, where are the hard questions? Well, I'll, I'll let you ask the first one. Then I guess Matt, how many uh, real Internet players do we have living in Sioux Falls? I know there's a couple mostly in hiding. Yeah. I'm guessing you they're probably in your phone. I mean, what's our representation here? I would guess that we have less than a dozen who are really pulling seven and eight figures. Yeah, it depends. Dot coms. It depends, you depends how you define it. Because, like, it's, it's, you know, John, John has a technology company, a uh, design company, and it's all, techno you know, computer technology based. How about just, like, e-commerce people with websites that make money yeah yeah it's not a large number that I'm aware of 10 to 20 yeah um, certainly there are people that are in the very early stages but people that have had traction not not a whole lot so if your major your biggest competitor came to you tomorrow and and wrote you a check for a ridiculous amount for market beat and it was a thing that you couldn't say no to you just said got to do it what would Matt Paulson do what would be the first thing that you would do after buying a racetrack and a, a, a gun range, of course? But mm. <laughs> just kidding. What would and you a pawn shop? And if, what would be the first thing that you would do with kind of like the rest of your life? Would you have a plan for something like that? That is a good question. Um, I thought about starting Market Beat two years ago, and I had some okay offers, not great offers. And ultimately, I, I kind of looked at it and said, well, um, I, I don't think there's a compelling reason to sell this because I don't know what I would do if I woke up tomorrow. Um, you know, the offers are kind of three times earnings, which were okay. Um, you know, kind of the bare minimum you think about selling it for. But um, even if I got a good offer, I just I don't know what I would do. I would probably take a month or two off and just kind of sleep, and then I would be bored and I would start another business. <laughs> but I, I don't think I could. I think I would get. I, I would not be happy if I didn't have something to do every day. So. Um, I, I would inevitably start another business, and I kind of like the one I have, so I might as well keep it. Well, do we do we have any more? Do we get everybody? We got to ask Matt anything. This is your chance. Although you can probably ask him anything any other time you want to. Also, just not on a microphone. 
Yes, sir. Yeah, um, my name is Jory. Matt, thank you for this morning. It's been very, very good and encouraging to hear your story. Um, who do you look like, or um, who do you have in your life as a mentor in business or outside of business? Can You don't have to name names or anything like that, but could you just give us an idea of mm -hmm. the people that surround you as a leader and grow you so that you can continue to grow? Sure. Nate, right there. <laughs> uh, I've known Nate for 10 years. Uh, he and I are very good friends. Uh, whenever I have a, a, a business or a life question that like, I, I, I'm i struggling with, I'll go talk to Nate. Um, I'm also part of a mastermind group uh, of other internet business owners. We meet twice a year, then we meet monthly online. So in terms of like business stuff, I can always bounce ideas off that group. Um, um, you know, if you're a parent with kids, it's, it's kind of hard to have friends and make friends. Um, so I'm glad that Nate and I became friends before we had kids. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, as somebody who who values your faith life, have you, in your experience building a company, have you found that to be a detriment, or have you found pushback from people in the community that maybe don't like you being overt about it, or mm -hmm. um, ha has that been an issue? I guess I'll just leave it more general. Um, if if it is, I I don't know about it. Um, you know, people in South Dakota are, are pretty polite, so even if you're like this, it's been a while since we've had a good Marine laugh. And <laughs> um, no, I I don't think so. Um, honestly, if 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 that's going to be something that's like a deal breaker, it's like that's okay, that's fine. If 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 you can't ha if you know if that's something that you can't handle, uh, that's okay. Uh, we don't have to. I don't have to be friends with everyone, and I will never be friends with everybody. I c can't make everybody happy. Um, I think it's more important to kind of know what you believe and stand for what you what you believe. And um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not going to be the guy that's um, that's telling other people oh to you know follow follow my beliefs. If if you know if if you're a Christian and I'm a Christian, you know, we can talk on a certain level. But if if you haven't made that decision in your life. Um, I feel like I, I, you know, it's not my place to hold you accountable, um, so and I mean you just interact differently. So I'm I'm not going to be the person that says, you know, you're going to hell. You need to go to church on Sunday. You know, that's not me. Um, so I I don't I haven't felt any big pushback. Um, it, it could be there. It could be like uh, there's there's Matt. He's you know a good Christian soldier. I'm not not interested in him. Uh, but if that is the case, nobody's really said anything. Should we do one more? I'll ask you, um, you wrote a blog post recently about what our community of Sioux Falls needs, right, mm -hmm. as far as the entrepreneur ecosystem. We have people here in the room that are either A, very, well, all are, are part of it because they're here, but B, have the power or energy or connections to move it forward. So what, like, be critical. What, what do we need to do? Like, we asked the question comparing us to Fargo. I agree that there's strengths and weaknesses, but they're also just inherently different, different yeah. cities with different resources. Um, what would you like to see someone in this room go and do to make the entrepreneurial system, ecosystem better? Yeah, honestly, I, I think in terms of this audience, like, you know, John and I are both in our mid-30s now. and this Early 30s. Okay, I'm 30. We're, thir we're both 33, right? We're the same age, yeah. Okay. Um, honestly, we kind of need that next generation of, like, startup champions. Um, you, know, j you know, the reality is we're probably not going to be doing this forever. Um, you probably don't want me as a 70-year-old 70 70 man um, <laughs> doing the same thing, and uh, God, I hope I'm not doing it then. Um, but we, we'd, like, we'd love to see some people in their mid-20s um, kind of following our footsteps, and I, thi I think that would be a, a very good thing. Because, uh, I mean, the reality is a lot of, a lot of the stuff in town is, is, is being organized by us or by Zio, and it's just it's, it's a pretty small group of people, so we would, I'd like to see that tent expand. Yeah, and I would argue the age parts are relevant, right? Just people who want to get involved. Yeah, that makes it's sense. It's sometimes easier for people in their 20s. To, they have more time to yeah. be involved. But it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Age is not a hard hard requirement. Totally. All right. So I am going to ask the question because it's, it's what we always finish with. So you know it's coming. Um, what can the Sioux Falls, I mean, you kind of just asked a version of it, but what can we do for, say, you or for Market Beat as the entrepreneurial mm. group of Sioux Falls 1 Million Cups? Yeah. I'm not a person with a lot of needs in life, in my, in my business. Like, 
Um, most of you people probably aren't my customers, so I'm not going to say go sign up for MarketBeat because you're probably not the demo for it, and that's okay. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to like give a generic, you know, pay it forward answer, um, but I, I think like I don't need help with a lot of things, and, and that, you know, I'm kind of at the point in my life where I, w I want to give back and encourage other people to give back. Um, so I don't know, help the next person down the line. That. All right, well, I think this, this was fun. This also works because Matt is very honest and vulnerable and transparent, and that's what made this um, very good. So let's give a round of applause for Matt. Uh, I'd love to, uh, did you guys like that format? Yes? Okay, cool. Um, you know, I think one thing our group has decided is that uh, you know, and, and Nate was here last month who created One Million Cups. Um, it's an awesome program, and, and by creating a template is what has allowed 150 other cities to adopt it. But we also know it's okay to tweak the template, right? And we're going to sometimes do it our own way and try new things. And so, you know, that's one thing we've done this year, and I think we're going to continue to do next year. So Craig had to leave, so we let him take the, 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 the deck down. But next week we is the last Wednesday of the month, so we jump over to Zeal for 1MC Unplugged, Vani Hariri. Will be uh, giving us an update on Think 3D. Um, he's an awesome guy and a, a great startup champion. So he's going to be talking about that at Zeal next week. And then it must be what November 7th must be the first Wednesday. Uh, we'll be back here in this room. Okay, thank you, Dwayne. And do you remember Matt? Who did we go to, to November 7th? Com corporate? Ca uh, yeah. Check the check the Facebook event. It'll be up there. So next week at Zeal, back here on the 7th. Thank you always for the great questions. Um, thank you to all of our sponsors who made the coffee uh, and allow us to be here at the Orpheum. So that's uh, First National Bank, Midco, Market Beat, um, Lemon Lee, uh, Zeal, and uh, Fearless Foundation. Thank you. So I don't have the deck. I don't want to forget anybody. But thank you, everybody. We'll see you guys next week. Have a great week.